So uh, what we're going to do now is start to look at some of the different uh, groups of plants. The first thing we'll do is go through life cycles uh, for each of the groups. Um, some of the things that they'll, they share in common, we'll see, and then some things that are unique. Uh, with this one being the, one of the first ones we're going to go through with the bryophytes, uh, which are the non-vascular plants, um, and particularly the mosses, so these are non-vascular. Uh, we're also going to be able to introduce some terms, and some of those terms will be unique for these groups, and some of those terms will carry over into the other groups. So you'll start to uh, build a list of terms that, um, like I said, in the future may be unique for a particular group, which you'll have to take note of, uh, or we'll, we'll carry over. So we're going to start off with uh, these structures here, and then we'll, we'll come back to uh, sort of a little circle. Spores. So spores are haploid, one end structures uh, produced by meiosis. The spores are distributed, and then from the spore, uh, cell division, mitosis, will take place. And it will start to produce multicellular structure, uh, which is called a protonema. So that's you know, this growing up out of the spore. So this would be the spore. The protonema are the cells growing now out of it that start to form a branching structure. We see this happening twice because we're going to kind of follow two pathways for male and female. From the protonema then emerges a bud of cells that start to form into more of a, a branching feather-like pattern that will become the gametophyte plant. And we see a gametophyte plant you know, here, and this is gonna be the uh, male gametophyte, and this is gonna be the, the female gametophyte. Um, so it, it's not very, they're typically fairly small, um, but they're not microscopic, all right? You can see them, uh, they're macroscopic, different species of moss. Um, there are some that can go up to two meters, but that's ext really extreme. Uh, usually only a few centimeters uh, in length, um, and, uh, but they vary, vary in their, their shape and structure. Some of them are much more encrusting over surfaces uh, and some of them are more upright, although they don't really have a lot of um, supporting tissue. And again, there's no vascular tissue uh, in there. So that's, that's what limits them both in their size and their, their vertical growth. There is not a root structure, but there is a uh, something like it, as you can see here, called a rhizoid. And this is important for a couple reasons. One, it's more like the algae hold fast than a root. So there's no vascular tissue there. There's no real true tissue there. It's, it's a cells that branch off. And in some groups of the non-vascular plants, um, it's not really even all that branching, but in the mosses, uh, it is a branching structure. One of the significant things about that is that there's often associations with the rhizoids and nitrogen fixing bacteria. So nitrogen-fixing bacteria are associated with these rhizoid structures. Uh, and that's going to be very important because mosses uh, will be an important part of nitrogen cycling and make, uh, getting nitrogen available, available in the soils uh, for other plants uh, through that association. So it's one, one of their significant roles. Uh, what's going to happen eventually uh, is that the gametophyte plant, which is a, again, the, all the cells remember this, all the cells of this multicellular organism, which is a macroscopic organism, you can see, uh, is, or they are, haploid cells. Right? So they're all one in cells, resulting from the spore. Some of them, right, at the very tip, so maybe I'll give a new color here, at the very tip of these structures uh, is an apical meristem. So it's a term, I don't know if I've brought up yet, so an apical meristem. 
meristem. So it's a, that is a unique characteristic in plants. Uh, and the apical meristem is a site of cell division. And not just, I mean, other cells can divide, but it's a site of rapid cell division and growth. All right, so this is where a lot of growth takes place. Typically, we see it in plants at the ends of roots and shoots, um, which we don't quite have here, but so we have sort of analogous structures to that. But we do have apical meristems, a site where uh, rapid cell division takes place, and then we start to get new structures uh, that will form. The new structures are these here, so we're now just kind of zooming in. So this is kind of a zoomed in structure. So we've kind of expanded this here. Uh, and we're looking at gametophores. Structures that are going to produce the gametes. And we really have, and we have two types. Uh, there's ones that produce um, sperm and some that produce egg. So the male sperm producing one are called the antheridia. And the female egg producing ones are called the archegonia. So typically, uh, inside these archegonia, you'll just have each one would just have a single egg, but each antheridia can produce many, many, many sperm. So what we have here is a spore that is then going to start to undergo cell division to form this string of cells, a branching structure, uh, and from that will grow more cells that will start to form the plant, our characteristic plant structure, um, that is called the gametophyte plant. Uh, so it's photosynthetic, but we don't quite have all the, the leaves and other stem tissues because we don't actually have vascular tissue there, and that's part of those. So we don't, so it's not true roots or true leaves uh, in this particular case. But we do have photosynthetic uh, structures that can absorb water, um, and they will then differentiate. Now, sometimes the one organism can have both the antheridia and archegonia in the same organism, but in others, they are two separate organisms. Uh, so you have some male plants and some female plants. So what we have here is now the antheridia producing the sperm. Again, this is all just still through mitosis because they're all one in the spores are one end, the cells of the protonema are one end, the cells of the gametophyte are one end, the cells of the antheridia are one end, they're all haploid cells. And so are the sperm, one end, haploid cells. Now, what's going to be required is that water is necessary for the sperm to leave the antheridia and then find an archegonia. Uh, and find egg to uh, fertilize, which means that they cannot reproduce without water. Uh, the sperm are swimming sperm that swim in the water itself. So these plants are uh, restricted to wet areas. So if you see an area where you see mosses, it, it has to be wet because they cannot reproduce without the sperm actually swimming in water to find an egg. Uh, so they do not occur in dry areas, uh, typically only in wet and moist areas. They receive a, a fair amount of rain and stay, stay moist uh, most of the year. In addition to that, sort of as a side note, um, they can withstand, though, um, massive amounts of desiccation, much more desiccation than many other plants can. So they do, they do desiccate sometimes, even though they'll have a cuticle. And all. They can desiccate and dry out, but then they can reabsorb water and kind of rehydrate themselves again, and it doesn't damage the plant at all. Uh, so what will happen now here in this process is the uh, sperm are released from the antheridia. They're carried by water. They then fertilize. This is an unfertilized egg, an ova. Uh, and then fertilization will take place here inside the archegonia. So fertilization will take place. And then we'll produce a zygote. So the zygote is now a 2N haploid cell, a single cell. That zygote will then start to divide through mitosis.
and begin to grow. Uh, and so now growing in, so it doesn't leave. So this is another thing important to note. The egg stays inside the archegonium. It's, it do, it's not, does not uh, go out into the environment for dispersal. Right? So the dispersal stage here is the spore stage. Um, the fertilized egg, the zygote, which the, with the developing embryo, is not a dispersal stage, as opposed to a seed, which we'll get to with other plants, where the seed uh, is another type of dispersal. Pollen will disperse, but then the seeds also will, will disperse. Uh, so here that stays within them. And then we start to have growing. So this structure here, this pinkish structure here, this growing inside the archegonium, that is going to be now the sporophyte plant. So the 2N sporophyte plant, in this particular case, is not a separate plant. In other groups, so as we can go through these life cycles uh, with several of the different groups, we'll have two separate organisms. So the gametophyte plant and the sporophyte plant, and they're two separate plants. Uh, one of them might be small, one of them might be large. So when we go into the next group, for example, the ferns or the pteraphyta, they're going to have a tiny little uh, gametophyte and then a very large sporophyte. Here, it's actually just the opposite. The gametophyte is the larger version of it. And the sporophyte is small. In addition to that, the gametophyte and sporophyte are together. Right? They're not two separate organisms. They're kind of part of the same. So the sporophyte plant actually grows within the gametophyte. It starts to branch out like this. And then we form um, these structures. It looks like a little stem-like structure here, like these structures here. Uh, they're called CD. Uh, and that's the sporophyte plant. So, so they're all two end cells making that sort of stem like structure. And then we have these growths at the ends okay, of the CD, which are the capsules, also called the sporangium. So the, close enough, I'll just kind of draw an arrow to that. So a sporangium is the capsule. So this is the structure that will then produce the spores. So inside these capsules, uh, meiosis will then occur, and the meiosis will produce spores. Then the capsule will open up through a structure called a, a peristome. So the peristome is sort of this uh, opening here. And then the spores will become distributed, uh, typically by uh, wind. It could be by, by water as well, but uh, they'll try to move away to other areas uh, so the, the organism can spread. The spores will find a good site for development, and then cell division will begin through mitosis, forming a new protonema, forming, forming a new gametophyte plant. The gametophyte will then develop to the point where it can produce uh, gametes, either uh, sperm in antheridia or eggs in the archegonia. Sperm will be released in water, more fertilization will occur, zygotes will develop then inside these antheridia to grow into new sporophyte plants, and then it will just kind of continue again and again. So that's kind of the, the life cycle. I think I'm going to write that up here. Um, we're talking about the, the life cycle. of a bryophyte, of a moss, um, and we have a bunch of terms, the you know, rhizoid, kind of a holdfast type structure, root type structure, but not truly a root, chloroplast, it's, it's its own thing, uh, and one of the significant parts of that I mentioned is the um, association with nitrogen fixing, uh, often cyanobacteria. Something else to mention about this group as a whole, and one of their significant um, to environmentally significant roles uh, is that uh, there are some of them, not, not, so not all mosses do this. Now, mosses in general can inhabit a whole variety of different habitats, They typically wet ones, but they'll crust over rock surfaces, they can grow uh, on other plants uh, in general and on top of soil, typically soil that may not even be that particularly healthy soil, but we can get mosses then growing on that soil um, because they'll just they don't need the, they don't have the root structures that uh, other plants do and have the same sorts of requirements. They do have nitrogen fixing bacteria associated with them, so they can get the nutrients that way. Uh, there are some groups, uh, groups called peat mosses, uh, 
that uh, live in environments called so these kind of wet uh, environments called bogs. And in these bogs, um, you know, they just do the same sort of thing. But these plants also um, alter the pH of the environment, and, and the pH of the environment becomes very acidic. Uh, and because of that, when the plants die, there's very little decay in that area. So the, the material doesn't break down. And neither does other material. So other types of organics that come into this area, into these bogs, they typically don't break down, and they're more preserved over time. As a result, because the material isn't broken down, it means a lot of their own organic material isn't then recycled or released back into the environment. And in this case, it's a, it's a good thing in terms of carbon dioxide. So these bogs and, and the, the dried up peat moss there in those bogs actually hold a lot of carbon dioxide and they remove a, a lot from the live plants or removing a lot from the atmosphere. But then when they die, it doesn't get re-released. It gets held or stored uh, in, in those organisms. So they have this sort of environmental significance as a carbon sump, where they're kind of like holding the carbon dioxide. Um, so two kind of roles, kind of bringing in the nitrogen fixing role and then the carbon uh, sump role, but not this isn't for all uh, mosses, but one uh, major group. And so that's kind of the, the overview of the moss or bryophyte life cycle.